Hello, my name is Mark Baines with Training Made Fun, and this is part two of four sections for anatomy and kinesiology. And we covered part one, so you want to make sure you look at that if you have not first seen that. And we have moved through the sagittal plane, uh, movements, general movements in the sagittal plane, and the frontal plane, and general concepts with kinesiology. And now we are on to the frontal plane. With the frontal plane, or I'm sorry, the uh, horizontal or transverse plane. For the horizontal or transverse plane, we're referring to motions that are uh, basically across the body or rotational type motions. And looking at the picture here, uh, with the woman here, you can see if she rotates her shoulder toward the inside, she turns it toward herself. That's going to be internal rotation, also referred to as medial rotation. If she takes that shoulder and turns it away, it actually goes toward the outside, it goes that direction. Then she's going to be moving more towards external or lateral rotation. The same would be true of the hip. Uh, a lot of people uh, think you can work the inner calf or outer calf, uh, but if you move the hip, that's what makes it so you can actually feel like you're putting emphasis on the inner or outer calf, but you actually can't do that uh, because you're actually moving the hip. It's not the uh, tibia. If you could somehow move the tibia and not move the femur, you could actually emphasize the inner calf or outer calf muscles of the gastroc, but you can't do it because you can't move the knee without moving the hip. So it's really hip motion that you're really getting. Uh, and that said, those are the basic two primary motions you're going to see in the horizontal transverse plane in terms it comes to rotation of the shoulder or rotation of the hip, a rotation of the spine of the cervical once again for the neck, the uh, thoracic for limbid middle back and lumbar for lower back. Uh, rotating the whole spine would also be a horizontal plane. Now, for you to bend over, which would be a flexion motion of the hip, uh, bending forward and then turn. You know, some would say, well, it looks like you're uh, bent over and then turning, so now it's a frontal plane motion for the spine. Nope, it's still rotation of the spine, so it is still. Uh, going to be in the horizontal plane or transverse plane. We typically refer more to it as the uh, horizontal plane, but either is correct. But other motions that are also in the horizontal plane would include well, cervical spine by itself, rotation-wise you'd see that, uh, or any area of the spine by itself. But uh, your shoulder, if you brought your arm across like a horizontal, like a fly, or back out to the side, like a reverse type fly, it would be horizontal adduction across in front and horizontal abduction out and away for a reverse fly. Uh, pronation and supination, uh, pronation and supination of the forearm. If the if this woman here were to turn her forearm, uh, internally rotating it toward herself, so thumb side turning in toward her body, she, that would be actually pronating her forearm. And then if she did that the opposite, where she turned her forearm outward, and actually turned it away, then that would be supination of the forearm, opening the palm up essentially, okay? Uh, for supination uh, similar to external rotation of the forearm. And you can technically move your shoulder internally or externally without moving the forearm into pronation or supination, but the forearm is unique unlike the lower leg and that you can actually rotate it without moving the shoulder, whereas you cannot rotate your tibia uh, or the tibial, tibia at the femur uh, without actually moving the entire femur in rotation uh, towards internal or external rotation of the hip. Uh, that said, move away from the horizontal plane, and talking more in general basic motions, looking first at this concept of anterior. The front of the body is always going to be the anterior. The back is going to be the posterior, the back side of this gentleman here. Uh, superior is going to be above. So the rib cage here would be superior to the pelvis. The pelvis in that midsection here. The pelvis is going to be inferior to the rib cage. Uh, the medial aspect of the inner part of the thigh, medial here, and the lateral aspect of the outside. Technically, the innermost quadricep muscle the thigh muscle that extends the knee, those thigh muscles here. The innermost one is going to be the vastus medialis obliquus, medial, medial, medial essentially, and the vastus lateralis is going to be on the outside, here referring to the outermost version of the quadricep muscle. Uh, and that said, looking at the concept of distal and proximal, uh, technically this gentleman's shoulder uh, and the elbow versus the wrist and the shoulder, the elbow is more proximal to the shoulder and the wrist is more distal from the shoulder. Now if you were to do an arm curl from this anatomical neutral position and bend his elbow upward into flexion, come back down, if he flexed his shoulder, his uh, arm upward, he would actually be moving the distal aspect of his arm, his forearm. Now if you were to do a row, the same gentleman where we're going to actually grab something out in front of him and pull backward, actually he would actually be moving the humerus, he'd be moving the proximal aspect of the arm, not the distal aspect. Likewise if you perform a squat, this gentleman now were to squat down and he sits down. He's actually going to be moving more uh, at the more the femur aspect as a role for the knee, for the knee motion, not the hip motion, but for the knee motion, he's moving the femur. 
specifically more so than the tibia. But if you're to perform a seated knee extension, the machine will say leg extension, where he's going to extend his knee forward into extension, the knee would be bent and he'd be bringing it forward toward anatomical neutral, right? Uh, that's going to be knee extension uh, and it's going to be the, uh, pro the distal aspect of his leg. So proximal and distal refer to more close to the midline or away from the midline. Uh, bilateral and unilateral. If he works both sides same time, he grabs a bar or grabs two different dumbbells, uh, working both sides at the same time in a curl or a press or anything for that matter, it's going to be a bilateral exercise. Uh, it's unilateral if he's only moving one side. It's often recommended for symmetrical challenges when someone has one side weaker than the other or they have issues of coordination one versus the other uh, or posturally they seem to have an issue one side versus the other. It's a very good idea to spend a lot more time performing unilateral type motions where only working one side then work the other side as opposed to bilateral motions. We don't want to be grabbing a bar or anything where we call closed chain. And if, when you're fixed to a machine or a barbell and if you move one part of you Move it, you're fixed it with your arms as an example, and you move one arm and it moves the other arm too because the bar moves, so it moves both arms. That's a closed chain activity. Now, physical therapy refers to closed chain as fixed to the ground. So if you hear closed chain at time with physical therapy, they're saying, they're saying closed chain, you're fixed to the ground. Open chain, you're not fixed to the ground. Okay? Whereas we talk biomechanically, more of an engineering definition in personal training, uh, where we're talking about closed chain being fixed to an object and move one side, it affects the other. Open chain would be two dumbbells or cable. Uh, having two separate pulleys or um, two separate cable attachments. You move one side, doesn't necessarily affect the motion at the other side. Unilateral is a very good way to go for symmetrical issues or coordination type issues, flexibility type issues, anything where there's a clear discrepancy in capabilities from left to right. Okay? Uh, superficial and deep. When you're talking about superficial and deep, abdominally, uh, the muscle everybody wants to be able to see from the rib cage down to the pelvis is the rectus abdominis. That's what everybody wants to be able to see. Uh, that is what, much more of a superficial type muscle. If you're lean enough and you have muscular hypertrophy, uh, you're going to have some nice looking abs, right? If you have both. Uh, oftentimes you may have heard people say that abs are made in the kitchen. That's just not true. Can't be any more clear than that. Uh, abs are definitely not made in the kitchen. Abs are made in the gym or made in exercise. If you don't eat very much, you will be lean. Or if you don't, if you eat the right foods, you will also be lean, right? Uh, but you're not going to see anything unless you have hypertrophy there, unless the muscle itself has size, has mass, has development. You've actually used those muscles in force, force development or force production. If you've not done that, you'll be thin um, or leaner, but you won't see a lot. There's nothing to see because there's no muscle. So abs are not made in the kitchen. They are made in the gym. You can see them better if you take care of yourself in the kitchen. Unquestionably true. Uh, that said, Deeper muscles, the ones you can't see, deeper inside this gentleman's core, the core which is technically uh, the lumbar sp spine area, uh, basically the middle, lower part of his spine, right? Uh, pelvis section right here, and the hip, the place where the femur meets the pelvis. Lumbo pelvic hip complex. Some people refer to the core as the lumbo pelvic hip complex. Some people incorporate the thoracic spine, more mid part of the spine, uh, the backside of him, which would also be true. Uh, but we tend to refer to it more as lumbo pelvic hip complex for the core. But deeper muscles in there that you might not ever, you'll never see unless you actually open somebody up or something horrible happened to be able to see that. Uh, the erector spinae, quadratus lumborum, transverse abdominis, multifidae. You're not going to see those muscles. No one's going to say, hey, I like your multifidae. It's not going to happen because people can't see it, whereas they can see the rectus abdominis. Unfortunately, put often put far too much emphasis on the superficial muscles and not enough on deep tissue. It's really important that we do. Uh, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not vitally important. Uh, prone versus supine. This guy were to lay down on his stomach, he'd be lying prone. If he were to lay on his back, he'd be supine. A uh, general question we often ask people is, is it better to be prone or supine or standing up when exercising? And a lot of people want to say it depends, which is a fair thing to say. But generally speaking, if the goal is to get the most out of exercise, we want to do anything and everything we can standing up. The only reason we would ever go to lie down, uh, prone or supine, is because the person's incapable of performing it standing up or you don't have the right equipment for it. But if the person's capable coordination-wise, movement skill-wise, and you have the machines or, or equipment for it, you should be standing up performing any exercise you can do lying down. Uh, the only reason you lie down is because it just isn't going to work standing up. That's about it. Okay? Uh, that said, we're talking about basic strength motions is what we're talking about here. I'm not talking about somebody who's a fighter and wants to grapple. You've got to be on the ground, clearly, as well as up, uh, standing up. Uh, that said, moving on. Going on to structure and functional muscle. Muscle cells, the cells themselves, are the largest cells in the body that create our, mo our movement. 
striated or striated muscle is what the skeletal muscle is, and the muscles attached, you know, muscle for tendon attaches to the bone, and the muscle attaches to the tendon, and the muscle goes and attaches other tendons and attaches another bone, and so on. All depending on the muscle configuration, it might be multiple multiple bones, maybe more than two, maybe it's just two. Just depends very much on the muscle. A lot of unique aspects to various muscles throughout the body. There's actually more than 400 skeletal muscles in the body. Luckily, it's not expected for any physical fitness professional, uh, physical educator, uh, coach, uh, even a physical therapist. They know every single muscle of the body and its exact function and what it does. Uh, we would call that person anatomical rain man to be able to recite what every muscle does. More importantly, do you understand the basic concepts of movement? Do you understand the basic uh, involvement of primary muscle groups? Because every independent muscle is not vital to every motion you engage in exercise. It'd be truly overwhelming and really not necessary. Uh, all information is good information, but there's definitely too much information uh, to be learned in the first few years of training. Let's start with our first big 40, 50, 60, 70 muscles. Let's not get to all 400 right away. Okay, that said, that's uh, not exact exact number, but that's a good general idea. Uh, there are 600 total muscles, meaning there's a lot of muscles that are smooth muscle, uh, basically internal organs, whereby they have involuntary function, functions. You're not going to uh, perform a lateral motion, lateral flexion of the spine, and expect to work your kidneys or your liver, right, or your pancreas. Uh, those muscles cannot be activated voluntarily. They are involuntary. The one unique muscle in our body that's both voluntary and involuntary significantly is our cardiac muscle, our heart muscle. We can affect our breathing differently. We can actually try to relax and focus on what we focus on on what we're doing, and we actually can regulate uh, to some extent heart rate. Can bring it down. We can also force it upward, but you cannot fully uh, control it. That's why it's both voluntary and involuntary. Uh, that said, our striated muscle, the muscles that are involved in exercise, in that moment, they're working voluntarily, and they have the capability to work voluntarily, all striated muscle, okay? It moves a particular bone in our body. We move, we activate that muscle, we get motion, that's a striated muscle or a striated muscle there. Uh, that said, there's bundles of fibers. So you have a single muscle fiber, something called the myofibril, surrounded by something called the endomycium, layers of fascia, connective tissue, surrounding it. Then you have groups of fibers, uh, basically the muscle fasciculus. Uh, basically you're talking about bundles of fibers all together here, surrounded by something called a paramyceum or a bundle of fibers. And you have numerous bundles, bundles of fibers composing your entire muscle itself, the entire belly of the muscle itself, uh, surrounded by something called epimyceum. Your body is very intelligent in that it does this so that you actually can accentuate or emphasize um, only certain fibers at a time. Unlike a light switch, turn on the light and it activates however many uh, lights are attached at one switch. You've got thousands of switches. So when you turn a switch on, by the way, the muscle is either on or it's not. It's called the all or none principle. Uh, when you recruit a particular muscle fiber, uh, when a neuron fires a given number of fibers, those fibers are on. Those workers, those cellular workers are going full bore everything they can. There is no between. They're either on or they're not. Exercise becomes more difficult and more and more fibers become involved. Exercise becomes less difficult, less and less fibers are involved. Or you get fatigued, you don't have a choice. Less and less fibers become involved, right? Uh, but it is not something whereby a muscle can partially contract. For that reason, we highly emphasize not spending a lot of time doing partial range of motion reps. Part working one range, another range, another range of the same exact motion. Work through a full range of motion, generally speaking, especially when you're working in mobility or flexibility. And probably when you do light loading, or depending on the person, depending on the capability of the person, possibly heavier loading. But just no real reason to be working partial reps. You cannot partially contract a muscle. So there's no rationale for doing it like a lot of people do in the gym. If they like doing it, that's different. Don't confuse like with necessary. And that said, tendons attach muscle to bone. They uh, tend to be fairly taut. Uh, ligaments attach bone to bone. They are more elastic and allow more motion, although they're also meant to restrict it. Uh, tendons technically connect the muscle to the bone and their job is to transmit the force. Who cares how strong your muscle is if your tendon can't transmit the force from the muscle to the bone to move the bone? You ever feel, feel pain or your client feels pain or your athlete feels pain in the joint, that's never good and you want to stop that exercise in the moment and three big things to do. Reduce the load, reduce the speed, reduce the range of motion a little bit. If one or all three of those things don't work, you have the wrong exercise application for what you're doing right now. Do something else until we can find out the cause of the pain because you're causing potential joint stress, uh, damaging connective tissue, and who knows what else. So stop what you're doing either, and then either reduce the weight, uh, reduce the speed, and or reduce the range of motion a little bit. But uh, if those don't work, new exercise, okay? And that is part two 
of Anatomy and Kinesiology with Training Made Fun for the Anatomy and Kinesiology, kinesiology section. We'll have part three up next.